Welcome to Hot Chips 25. Session 9, Processors 3. I'm Israel Cohen from the University of Massachusetts, and we'll have three presentations in this uh, session. And as you will see, all of them have something to do with the Spark architecture for server or enterprise applications. The first uh, talk is from Toshio Ishida from uh, Fujitsu. Toshio is a director of the Processor Development Division in the Enterprise Server Business Unit at Fujitsu. He has been working on Spark 64 5 processor design since 2000 and has been involved in the development of Spark 6, 7, 8FX, 9FX, X, and X+, and will keep on doing it. And he received his master's in physics from the Graduate School of Science at the University of Tokyo. Toshio, please. <coughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Toshio Yoshida. I'm a director at Fujitsu, Enterprise Server Business Unit Processor Development Division. Thank you for coming to this session. Today, I'm excited to introduce Spark 64 Templars, Fujitsu's next generation processor for Unix servers. My presentation consists of three parts. First of all, I would like to share some of the history behind the Fujitsu processor. Second, the majority of the this presentation is in-depth discussion of Spark 64 Templars, we, starting with an overview of the chip. We will look at the software on chip features and the microarchitecture of Spark 64 Templars, as well as the system architecture, reliability, availability, serviceability features, and power management. Finally, I will summarize my presentation and have a time for questions. Let's start with a brief history of Fujitsu processor development. Fujitsu has been developing CPU for over 50 years. The last 25 years, oh, sorry, which, which are shown on this slide have been dominated by the CMOS technology. Currently, Fujitsu develops processors for HPC, Unix, and mainframe servers. Each product line has a different instruction set. However, these processors are all designed by the same team and basically share common microarchitecture. Spark 64.6 and 7 were sold, so used in the Spark Enterprise servers sold by Fujitsu and Oracle. Spark 64.8 FX was designed for the K computer, which held the top position in June 2011 and November 2011, top 500 list. Spark 64 10 plus is the enhanced successor to Spark 610, which we developed for our new generation of Unix servers. This slide shows the semiconductor no process node and the number of transistors for each Fujitsu processor. Both Spark 6410 and the Templars 
are imp implemented in the CMOS, CMOS Kappa 28 nanometers process. Let me explain about the SPAC 64 templates in more depth. I will start from the design concept and the given overview of the chip. The design concept of the SPAC 64 10 and 10 plus is to combine Fujitsu's HPC and Unix processor features. Our goal was to achieve both single thread performance and high throughput. For single processors, uh, for single thread performance, SPAC 64 10 plus runs at a higher clock speed. We have enhanced the microarchitecture in several areas. As with the SPAC 6410, the CPU is connected directly to the DIMM to reduce the memory access latency. In addition to single thread performance, there has been increasing demand for high throughput to enable processing of the massive amount of the data. So we have introduced the following function in the SPAC 6410 and 10 plus. Each core provides CMD parallelism and more floating point registers. Each chip has 16 multi-threaded cores with high bandwidth interconnect and memory links. SPAC 6410 and 10 plus systems scale up to 64 CPU sockets in a single shared memory system. Finally, we have introduced new instructions to speed up certain software functions, such as a cryptography, decimal calculation, and database processing. We call these functions software on chip. Here is the die photo of the SPAC 6410 plus. You can see the 16 identical core and the shared 24 megabytes level two cache. Each core can run two threads in parallel. Memory and PCI Gen3 controllers are embedded on the chip. The DDR3 interfaces provides over 100 gigabytes per second of peak memory throughput. The die size is about 600 millimeters squared with around 3 billion transistors. The chip runs as fast as 3.5 gigahertz plus. Here is a simple diagram of the SPAC 64 10 plus pipeline. The basic structure is similar to SPAC 64 10. The red portion indicates the enhancement we have made in the SPAC 64 10 plus. We added more entries in pattern history table and implemented a new local pattern table to improve the branch prediction. We improve the management of the register window switch in the decoder stage to reduce the probability of the stores. The software on chip engine for Cypher, Decimal, and the database processing have also been enhanced. We also improve the throughput of a level one data cache and increase the CPU to CPU interconnect speed from 40.5 gigabps to 25 gigabps. In the next few slides, I will describe these enhancements in more depth. <coughs> Let's start with the enhancement to the software on chip. The concept of the software on chip is simple. Hardware designed for software. 
For Spark 6410 and 10 Plus, the software on chip targets are encryption, decryption, decimal, <coughs> decimal operation, and database acceleration. To maximize the flexibility of software, we implement the various software on chip functions as extension to instruction set, rather than a dedicated coprocessor. The hardware engine for software on chip are located within a floating point unit so that these functions can fully utilize a large set of 128 floating point registers. This photo shows the layout of the core. Software and chip function account for less than 3% of the core and less, less than 1% of the chip area. Spark 6410 and 10 Plus accelerates the AES, DES, SHA, and RSA operations. As you can see from the graph on the left, a new instruction in SPAC 64 10 plus and increased clock speed further improves the performance of RSA sign library. The graph on the left illustrates the improvement in performance of the number decimal libraries. Here's the microarchitectural enhancement and higher clock speed in SPAC 6. <laughs> SPAC 6410 Plus speed up the add and multiply number libraries by 64% and 32% respectively versus SPAC 6410. For database acceleration, we implemented the installation in SPAC 6410 and 10 Plus to speed up data manipulation and integer byte compares. Spark 6410 introduced an instruction to accelerate the byte vector manipulation. This instruction extracts the two fields two field from the operand one and operand two via byte level shift and mask operation and combine the two fields with, the op with the OR operations. SPAC 6410 Plus extends this instruction so that the bit level shift and mask values can be specified to manipulate bit vectors. Furthermore, a new instruction set New, new instruction is implemented that extracts two, op, two bit field from the operand one and perform a logical operation with operand two. These instructions are useful for aligning contiguous bit level data that can then be handled by the byte vector instructions. For integer byte compares, SPAC 64 templars provides a similar support to handle 128-bit data in the both pipelines. We basically could loop the throughput of the integer byte compares. Next, I would like to talk, talk about the microarchitecture en enhancements in, in a little more detail. Spark architecture organizes most of the integer register in register windows. Register window switches occur when calling or returning from a subroutine or a library call. Previous Spark 64 processor supported out of order execution across only one window switches. The enhancement in the SPAC 64 templars enable out of order execution across all the window switches between the same two adjacent windows. Renaming for the 48 integer registers allows the registers to be accessed in an out of order manner. 
SPAC64 templates also has improved the branch prediction mechanism. It implements a rehashed indirect branch predictor for indirect branch with various target addresses. A new local pattern <coughs> branch predictor has also been implemented. Finally, the number of pattern history table entries has been increased. SPAC64 templates as a dedicated light pipeline for the level one data cache, which consists of eight sets of eight banked lamps. One light and two lead can, can be performed each cycle, except when a lamp bank conflict occurs. This graph compares the level one data cache throughput for SPAC64 seven plus 10 and 10 plus. The performance of reader only in SPAC 64 templates is improved by the higher clock speed. Write only and copy performance are improved by the increased clock speed and the dedicated light pipeline. In addition, the throughput of the memory, atomic memory operations and hardware prefetch is increased. Now let's talk about the system architecture. <coughs> SPAC 6410 and 10 plus systems scale from one to 64 CPU sockets. CPUs are connected by the directory-based cache coherency to reduce the latency and minimize the snoop transaction. The interconnect speed has been enhanced from 14.5 gigabps to 25 gigabps. SPAC 6410 and Templar systems are constructed from the building block, which allows for the flexible system configurations. Each building block or BV is composed of four CPUs and two crossbar chips. Crossbar chips is for the external connection with other BBs. The total external bandwidth is about 168 gigabytes per second. Up to four BBs can be connected directly via the onboard crossbar chips. Up to 60, <coughs> up to 60 BBs can be connected with the addition of crossbar boxes. This graph demonstrates the scalability of the SPAC 6410 and the Templar systems design. This results were measured for the SPAC 6410. Directly based cache coherency and high speed interconnect both contributes to the scalability of the system. SPAC 6410 realizes high scalability across a wide range of applications, including integer, floating point, Java, ELP, data warehouse. I want to also discuss the extensive reliability, availability, serviceability features implemented in the SPAC 64 Templars. SPAC 64 Templars has mainframe class last features, which are summarized in the table on the left. Both cache tag and data are ECC protected or duplicated. Both integer and floating point registers are ECC corrected, ECC protected. And all LUs are parity or residue protected. If part of the cache are, is faulty, the hardware will automatically isolate that portion of cache and keep learning. We call this mechanism cache dynamic degradation. Furthermore, 
If a parity error occurs during the instruction execution, the hardware automatically retries the instruction to remove the transient error. This mechanism is called hardware instruction retry. Similarly, when the interconnect detects the single bit error, the data will descend automatically. In the case of the, a permanent error, the hardware will degrade the lane dynamically and continue operation. We call this lane dynamic degradation. Finally, the number of the error detector is increased to, to 54,000 to identify the failure point more precisely. The diagram in the middle graphically shows the last capability of the Spark 64 Tempras. Most of the chip area is green, which means the single bit error correctable. The chip's last features guarantee the data integrity and enable Spark 64 Tempras to keep on running. Finally, let's talk about the power management. SPAC 6410 and 10 plus implements several power management mechanisms that helps to save power while the system is idle. We have several CPU lowest power states. Frequency and voltage are decreased dynamically for keeping all caches coherent. State transition were managed by the software. Actual power saving of 45% were measured for the SPAC 6410. The transition time between the these states is about 1.7 milliseconds. During this transition, the CPU is able to continue working, so it is possible for the CPU to wake up from the idle quickly. Furthermore, the on-chip memory control controller supports dim power saving by providing the two lower power states, power down and self-refresh. Okay, let's summarize. SPAC 6410 Plus is the Fujitsu's latest SPAC processor, which has been designed for the Fujitsu's new generation of Unix servers. SPAC 6410 Plus realizes improved single-thread performance with a higher clock speed and microarchitecture enhancement and software on chip. Furthermore, SPAC 6410 and 10 Plus systems realize high scalability from one to 64 CPU sockets, up to 2048 threads. Of course, the SPAC 64 Tempras implements the extensive Rust features. With cutting edge technology and commitment to the excellence, Fujitsu will continue to develop the SPAC 64 series of the processors, that's all. Thank you for listening attentively. We do have time for a couple of questions. <coughs> Deep Please Deep uh, state from your AMD. name and affiliation, although I know you very well. Devjit Das Sharma from AMD. So you mentioned that you support uh, decimal floating point standard DPD in software. Now, do you do any hardware enhancements in the binary FPU to support that, or it's completely in software going through conversions, you know, from DPD to binary in software? Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, the, the question was, I think you mentioned that you support decimal floating point decimal in software yeah, with the DPD standard, the recent IEEE DPD, standard. Uh, yes, yes. Do you have any hardware enhancements to speed that one up, or it's completely in software using the native binary floating point unit? Uh, uh, we have enhanced the DPD, uh, 
DPD floating point resistor from the SPAC 6410 and, uh, uh, and uh, <coughs> we... Um, Do you have decimal hardware in floating yes, point yes, unit? Yes, yes. Hard so you have a binary floating point unit and a decimal floating point unit? This, this, uh, mm. by, uh, this model floating point unit. Okay, is, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. Hi, John Delaney. I was wondering, I couldn't catch it in your slides, but what is your maximum main memory configuration, please? Memor memory configuration? Uh, uh, maximum, maximum, each socket, each CPU socket supports a one terabyte memory capacity. Uh, total uh, 64 terabyte in the system. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Bounds from AMD. Um, on the load store bandwidth, are those 128-bit uh, loads and stores or 256-bit? Uh, What's the size of the loads and stores you can do? What? Pardon? Sorry. You can do two loads and a store per cycle. Yes. Are those 64-bit, 128-bit, 256-bit? 128-bit. Yes, each load and store supports 128-bit data okay. with. And for the L2 cache, um, what's the bandwidth out of the L2? Um, uh, or uh, is it this a... This is a, a confidentiality. We don't uh, open this okay. information. Okay, and Sorry. you're not willing to say, tell, tell me what the latency is either, I guess. Re so you won't tell me what the latency is, I suppose? Re latency? Yeah, to the L2. Uh, latency... Uh, Everyone latency is uh, takes the four so four cycle, but um, we don't uh, disclose the level two late okay. cache readiness. So we'll Sorry. have to measure it if we buy one, I guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. The second talk is titled uh, Spark M6 Oracle's Next Generation Processor for Enterprise uh, Systems, and it will be presented by Ali Vaidsafa. He received his MS from San Diego State in 83, and in the past 30 years has been involved in many aspects of computer development, design, analysis, verification, and software development. He joined Sun in 2000, and he is now with Oracle since 2010. His current responsibilities include DFT, RAS architecture across all Oracle's processor and custom chips. Please. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for staying late in the evening. Uh, my name is Ali Vaid Safa, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be here this afternoon uh, representing Oracle Microelectronics for the introduction of the next generation enterprise processor. The disclaimer here basically says that we are disclosing the general direction of the design and not promising to make any of these features available in any particular timeline. Um, so for the presentation, I've organized it by a quick history of Spark processor, mostly to gain perspective on where the next processor stands in the overall roadmap, uh, then followed by a review of the internals of the processor and review the scaling concepts and finish by an overview of RAS. So Spark has been around for well over two decades now and has brought many innovations to the market. Uh, one example is the Ultra Spark 1 processor that brought 64-bit processing uh, to the general purpose uh, main, uh, computers. Uh, more recently, we had the Ultra Spark T1 processor that brought massively threaded systems uh, to the general public. The T2 and T3 followed the concept by pushing more threads into the cores and more cores in the socket and more sockets in the system. Since 2004, uh, 2011 and the Spark T4, we are in the midst of the next phase of evolution of massively threaded systems. This is all about pushing the single thread performance and extending the reach of these systems to a higher set of commercial workloads. Uh, the enabler was the Spark S3 core and its implementation of dynamic threading. So what is that all about? Uh, it's well known that for parallel workloads, the single thread performance can become the bottleneck. Uh, there are different ways of mitigating this. Uh, for example, we can rely on an uh, operating system scheduler to reduce the number of active threads in a core when we need high performance. In Solaris, this is called critical thread scheduling. What it means is that when a thread is recognized as needing high performance, it is dispatched in a core with higher uh, or with fewer thread counts. 
fewer threads does reduce contention for shared resources, but if you have uh, resources that are statically allocated to each thread, those resources go unused. Uh, dynamic threading is all about a pipeline design that can reallocate and reclaim all the pipeline resources and give them to the remaining thread. Uh, for an out-of-order pipeline, this is particularly effective because out-of-order engine can look much further into the instruction stream and performance boost goes up more dramatically. Uh, Spark S3 core uh, is an out-of-order pipeline and it is dynamically threaded and compared to the previous generation, it provides up to 7x uh, boost in single thread performance. The S3 core first appeared in the T4 processor. Uh, this is a 40 nanometer chip. Uh, it packs eight cores in the chip and can scale up to four sockets in the system. The follow-on T5 was disclosed in uh, last year's hot chips. Uh, it is in 28 nanometers, uh, doubles the core count to 16 per socket and doubles the scaling up to eight in the, in the system. Uh, M5 is the first uh, enterprise variation. Uh, it is 28 nanometers. The key differentiator is the higher cache to core ratio. In the case of M5, we have 48 megabytes of L3 cache and six cores per socket, but the system can accommodate up to 32 sockets. So what is for the next processor? Well, sorry, uh, jumped ahead to the following slide. So here, uh, T5 and M5 have been available on the market since the beginning of the year and have started racking up uh, many performance accolades. Uh, for today's presentation, we'll not get into the details of the benchmarks, but there are references listed at the end if you're interested. Uh, the main takeaway is that massively threaded is applicable to a wide set of uh, enterprise workloads. So what is for the next processor? Uh, the objective is to expand the high end uh, of enterprise servers. Uh, what runs on these servers is uh, consolidation of virtualized workloads or uh, single image databases, in particular in-memory databases and applications. Both of those can benefit from higher thread count and higher memory footprint. And of course, the high bar for RAS has to be maintained, uh, if not pushed higher. And it is also imperative that the benefits of the new processor should be immediately accessible to the current workloads, no recompilation and no major retuning. So the solution offered in the M6 processor is simply doubling the core count from six cores to 12 cores per sockets. Uh, for applications that cannot have more threads, the benefit comes from having access to more critical threads. Uh, for applications that can have more threads, there's twice as many uh, threads per socket available. And of course, the socket count can scale up to 96. Now, what's in the processor? Um, so we pack. 12 S3 cores. Uh, we touched on the core before, and it was also covered in the 2011 hot chips in detail. So I've just listed a few highlights on the left side. There's integrated encryption functionality and a few enhanced instructions for Oracle software stack. Uh, the main notable feature is that it's a dual issue out of order pipeline with dynamic threading. Uh, can execute from eight uh, to one thread simultaneously and going from eight threads to one uh, the performance boost for single thread is anywhere from two to four X. Uh, L1 and L2 caches are per core. Um, we have 16 kilobytes of I cache and 16 kilobytes of D cache. Uh, L2 is unified 128 kilobytes. Outside the, uh, outside the cores, we have 48 megabyte L3 cache that's organized in four banks. Uh, notable features, uh, we have allocating DMA based on uh, PCIe uh, transaction layer packet hints. We also have the request bundling features. Uh, what it means is that once a line is acquired, all the pending local requests to that line are serviced before the line is taken out. Uh, this is used to enhance the overall throughput for highly contested uh, uh, lines. Memory subsystem, uh, there are four memory links. Uh, each link passes through a pair of uh, buffer on board chips in a cascaded formation. Each BOB chip has two DDR3 channels, and each DDR3 channel has two DIMMs, a total of 32 sockets, and one terabyte of storage per socket. Uh, there are many address interleaving modes uh, to allow the system designers to balance the performance versus RAS versus power. Uh, there are many write buffers in the scheduler, and they're organized per rank. This gives better visibility into the overall traffic and more intelligent arbitration between the writes and reads. And of course, we have uh, the DIMM power saving mode. For I.O. subsystem, we have two PCIe root complexes driving by 8 PCIe Gen 3 links. Uh, there's atomic support for atomic operations. There's also support for virtualized uh, I.O. 
Uh, we do support uh, transaction layer packet hits for allocating DMA. Uh, for error handling, there's a combination of uh, proprietary errors as well as PCIe architected errors. Uh, for the latter, uh, signaling is via PCIe messages that are passed to the, to the driver. Uh, we also support independent reset for each uh, PCI subsystem. And this is how it all comes together. Uh, 12 cores shown at the bottom, four L3 banks, a 12 by five crossbar connecting them. The fifth port of the crossbar is the IO subsystem. Memory subsystem shown on top. Coherence controller sits between the caches and the memory. Uh, the links shown on the two sides, uh, please make a me mental note of this. Uh, the seven links on the right are coherency links or C links for connecting to other processors. Uh, the six links on the left, the scalability links, are used for connecting to the directory chips. We'll use this information in a couple of slides from now. Uh, there's also an on-chip, high bandwidth, low latency uh, fabric for connecting the links and the coherence units in the I.O. subsystem. The fabric can also do link-to-link -link routing, which is allowing the chip to operate as a switch in a larger system coherency fabric. Same information on the chip floor plan. Um, cores, Dell 3 banks, and the, controller, the controllers and the data banks. The crossbar, memory controller and the memory links. I.O. controller and I.O. links. And coherence controllers, the directory and coherence and scalability links. 4.1 terabits per second total link bandwidth and 4.27 billion transistors. Now about scaling. Uh, so if you remember in the previous slides, I said that each processor has seven CLs for connecting to other processors and six SLs for connecting to external directory chips. The group of processors that are connected with CLs are called an SMP. Uh, we have seven CLs and we can build two-way, four-way, and eight-way topologies. On the right side, I'm showing an eight-way topology, and this is the example that's used for the rest of the presentation. Uh, each SMP can boot as a standalone system. This is called a glueless configuration. Uh, coherency is uh, directory-based, and the directory is address sliced across all eight sockets, and so is the memory. Uh, address hash function to get to the memory home and the directory home is not necessarily the same. To build larger scale, we need to have a directory off chip in a directory chip, and the directory chip is accessed using the six SL links. Here I'm showing a 32-way glued system. Uh, as you can see, the top and the bottom shows four SMPs. Uh, each SMP is eight-way and is still connected using the CLs, but now we're actually using the six SLs to connect to the directory chip as well. Uh, the directory chip is named Bixby, and it's the subject of the following presentation. Uh, for a 12-way system, we, have, uh, we require 12 Bixby chips, and each Bixby chip represents one twelfth of the entire address space, so if you have a request, you have to make your way to the proper directory chip. Uh, you may notice that the directory chips are not connected to each other, and also that each processor is not connected to all the directory chips. So depending on the request, you may have to get uh, routed through another processor to get to the other directory. Um, the links are uh, colored in two different colors, red and blue. Sorry for the print not showing the colors. Uh, so if you happen to be, let's say, in a red region and the address that you have needs to be serviced by a directory in the blue region, you have to change political persuasion, jump across another processor through a C-link, and uh, that other processor routes your request to the directory. Uh, the responses and acknowledges backtrack the path of the request. Uh, data is more flexible and can be spread across any link and it self-routes back to the requesting node. Of course, larger systems are possible, 48-way shown here, 64-way here, and 96-way here. This is the maximal configuration. I will not talk much about these uh, for the rest of this presentation. The subsequent presentation will cover these in a very detailed way. Uh, So uh, I just showed those measures to give you a sense of what the complexity of the coherency is. Uh, coherency is complicated even on, even on small scale. Uh, the usual suspects are trade-offs between bandwidth, latency, uh, complexity, and deadlocks, live locks, starvation, forward progress. Uh, we also have to observe uh, ordering rules for Spark and PCIe for memory, I.O., and interrupts. 
Uh, for large scale, the problem is compounded because there are thousands of requesters. It's no longer possible to build fully sized queues. It's no longer possible to have fully interconnected components. Uh, the latencies start to become asymmetric and they have to be factored into the design. So here I'm giving you a sense of the protocol that we have adopted by going over a very simple transaction. It's simple in the sense that there's a line miss and you request for the line and it's brought to you to, to use it. Um, the requester uh, sends the request to the directory chip at the same time sends a speculative read to the memory home. Uh, after the line is locked, the directory uh, does a directory lookup and sends a response back to the requester saying how the transaction will complete. If the line is not in any cache, the command is sent to the memory home to send the data. The speculative read has gotten a head start on the DIM access. Uh, when the data is ready, it's forwarded back to the requester. If the line is present in one or more caches, the nearest cache is instructed to send the data. If necessary, invalidates are sent to other requesters, other nodes, uh, to invalidate their copies. Uh, the data is returned back to the requester directly, and invalidates are also acknowledged back to the requester directly. Uh, the requester collects all the components of the transaction, and after everything is received, it sends a completion back to the directory to release the line and complete the transaction. And remember that there are thousands of these transactions happening at the same time, many of them for the same address over the complex mesh that we saw. So the point is that small scale coherency cannot scale to a large system. It's also, I hope it's obvious that large scale coherence is complicated. So the approach we have taken is to design coherence from ground up for the largest possible system and then par parameterize some of the features so smaller systems can build efficient implementations of that. And then we deploy from small to large. The first introduction with the T4 processor included the L2 to L3 protocol but the interchip protocol was the older Snoopy protocol. T5 introduced the new interchip protocol, but in GLUELESS formation with a directory on chip and symmetric pass to all the directory and memory. M5 product include, uh, introduces the GLUT configuration with two color planes, and now we're ready for full-scale deployment. Now we'll look at some of the RAS features. This is a general error flow, and some systems may do different variations of this. At the lowest level, hardware has the checkers and is responsible for first order error cleanup. It may also autonomously decide to deconfigure certain components. For example, service lanes may be taken off. Uh, the main uh, other feature is that there's a large set of error registers that hardware captures significant details about the location and the type of the error and the different syndromes. Uh, once the error is captured in these register, an interrupt is sent to the hypervisor. Uh, hypervisor is in-memory firmware that has other responsibilities, but for error cleanup, it may assist with the more complex cases. It may also decide autonomously to deconfigure certain components. For example, it may retire cache lines. The main objective, though, is to read the error registers and analyze them and form an error report and send it to the service processor. Service processor has a database of the different faults and the different corrective actions. It also keeps a running log of the error events on this processor or in this system. Once a new report is received, that error is put into the error log and compared against the previous history. Uh, a decision is made whether any corrective action is required or not. If necessary, a service call is made. And if necessary, uh, some deconfiguration commands are issued back to the hypervisor. An example feature here is uh, activating dim spare pin function that we'll talk about shortly. A message going back to the hypervisor activates a series of smaller operations that deconfigure that feature. Uh, for more complex or uh, resources that are visible to the user, Solaris may have to get involved. Uh, examples are retiring threads, retiring cores, or retiring pages. For internal errors, the general policy is inline correction where possible. Uh, some critical paths, however, have uh, flush and retry. Uh, the general error cleanup causes the correctable data to get corrected, of course, and uncorrectable data, if it's clean, it gets discarded and refreshed from memory. Uh, if the data is dirty, it's converted to poison, and what that means is that the error is contained to the thread that owns that data rather than crashing the whole system. A special emphasis has been put on cache structure to go beyond uh, soft error recovery uh, and build error uh, persistent error resilience. 
uh, features that allow that or examples of features that allow that are, for example, on a replay from a cache error, we always take the bypass path and do not install the line in the cache. Uh, other examples are coherent transaction to retire a cache location or unretire a cache location. Uh, the suggested use is for a uh, hypervisor to aggressively the, retire the line immediately, and if service processor decides that this was unnecessary, the line can be unretired. Of course, end-to-end -end protection is the name of the game for enterprise servers. Uh, the gray regions are for DFD and debug and do not have protection. Inside the core, uh, the baseline capability is uh, parity and retry. Some structures have higher protection. Uh, the register files, for example, have ECC. Uh, they cannot be retired explicitly, but on a persistent error on a register file, the, the threat can be retired. Uh, the caches, of course, have ECC on all their structures and they have the line retire capability. Uh, the crossbar and the coherency fabric has address parity protection and data ECC protection. Uh, the cache and the directory, the L3 cache and the directory have ECC on all structures and line retire capability. Links have CRC and lane failover capability and you get end-to-end -end protection. For DIMMs, uh, error handling is uh, done by the processor. Uh, ECC is optimized for device correction. Uh, we also have the scrubber that periodically accesses all cache lines and prevents accumulation of multiple upsets in any individual cache line. We also have an e-retry engine that at any given error, it generates a rapid series of reads and writes to characterize the failure as being uh, transient or persistent. For persistent errors, uh, there are many ways of addressing these. Uh, service processor is where the decision is made about the nature of the error and whether the fault is localized to anything that can be retired. Uh, for a cell fault or a word line fault, uh, Solaris gets involved to retire one or more pages. Uh, for a pin failure or a bit line failure, uh, a dim connectors are a common point of failure and we have a feature that allows us to uh, remove one of the pins. This is the feature of the ECC that allows packing the data into the dim using only 71 pins out of the 72. Uh, the decision is done by the service processor, but once it's activated, hardware has uh, the, the hardware uses the scrubber to read the data from the old encoding scheme and re-encode it and write it back into the DIM with the new encoding scheme and basically stop using the, the broken pin. Uh, if the whole device fails, uh, inline correction continues to correct the data. Uh, a service call is made, uh, but depending on the configuration and address configuration of the DIMs and whether there's enough memory available, all the data can be migrated out of the DIM into another available location. In summary, um, we are at the leading edge of design and technology. We are tuned for Oracle systems. We are enabling the next enterprise system, which uh, is providing unprecedented performance for the Oracle software stack. Uh, in closing, I want to go back to the previous slide that we saw. Uh, since 2011, we have been introducing three chips in rapid succession and now a fourth one. Sometimes it's difficult to see the forest because of the trees, so I just wanted to clarify the message that these are a family of the processors that were conceived and designed at the same time, and they're being rolled out based on the technology availability. Uh, they are all based on the S3 core, and the intention is to increase the single thread performance and push massively threaded systems into a higher uh, set of workloads. Please read at your leisure. This is the, <laughs> this is the list of benchmarks. Thank you. We can take a couple of questions. Yes, please, go ahead and right. Uh, Viranjit Madan from Qualcomm. Yes. Uh, nice talk, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, about, uh, you have very impressive RAS features. Do you have any idea of how many of these failures actually occur in the field and what kind of uh, statistics there are in, in practice? For soft errors, we have uh, data from Los Alamos. We do experiments to figure out the soft error rates. But some of the features that you see are uh, trying to build resistance to stock failures or, for example, to enable a fail-in-place service strategy that's needed for high availability systems. Um, so no particular information available. We don't have long-term history with the technology, but we're enabling a fail-in-place strategy. Would you be publishing some of the data in future? 
uh, failure rate information are generally not published. Uh, yeah, Bill Rash, uh, Intel. A couple quick questions. Yes. The, the M6 looks like it's socket compatible to the M5. Is that the case? Uh, I think the pins are compatible, but I'm not sure the other performance characteristics, like the thermal and power, may not be compatible. So I don't think they're meant to be pin replacement. OK, and then, yeah, you led into my second question, is with the extra cores, then how much extra power does that add? Um, I did not talk about power. Uh, those are system parameters. There's advanced DBFS capability that allows system designers to adjust the power performance and cooling capabilities. And based on that, those parameters will be decided. So once the system is available, those numbers will become part of the specs for that system. OK, thank you. Okay. Let's go ahead. So uh, Anand from Broadcom, two questions about the dynamic threading. Yes. One is, you know, how dynamic? Can you comment on, you know, where the decisions are made? And then uh, the second is, with the benefit of the, you know, the first ship in your customers' hands, can you comment on, you know, what was the sweet spot of sort of number of threads for your customers' workloads? Uh, I do not want to emphasize the core today. It was covered in the uh, Hot Shift 2011. Uh, dynamic threading, well, it's very dynamic. Everything is, is, re is re reallocated and scheduled. Uh, in customer hand, it has proven to be very effective and sometimes surprisingly positively for us. Yes. Thank you. Let's go to the left one. Uh, Hassan K. Arasani, UC Santa Cruz slash Intel. A uh, couple of quick questions. I noticed you mentioned uh, virtual I.O. Uh, I assume you have like I.O. MMU uh, structures and I.O. TLPs, right? Correct. Uh, is it like distributed or a centri centralized kind of structure? I'm not sure what the distributed. Physically, that's every PCIe root complex has its own TLB. Uh, there's no external TLB uh, that's common to both of them. Each, each PCIe root complex has its own copy. I see. Could you comment on how many level of TLBs are there? Uh, in the IO subsystem? Yes. I think just one. I, I'm not sure. I don't know that detail. Thank you. Uh, Carl Hewitt. Apart from being water-cooled, what are the significant technology differences these days between mainframes and the kind of thing you're talking about here? Looks like you're putting in all the kinds of protections that have traditionally gone into mainframes, et cetera, and... I don't think I'm able to comment on cooling technologies that are different. No, 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 I'm just saying that is a difference. Are there other significant differences? I cannot comment on that okay, either. Thank just you. Just describing what we do, and if we can... Okay, thank uh, you. ...supplant mainframes, that would be great. Yeah. Thank right. you. The last presentation in this conference, but definitely not the least, is a follow-up to the previous one, and it uh, discusses uh, scalability and coherency directory ASIC in Oracle's high scal highly scalable enterprise system. It will be given by Thomas Wicke and Jürgen Schulz. Thomas is a senior principal hardware engineer in the microelectronic architecture group at Oracle. His technical interests include large system architectures and interconnect design. He has a PhD from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. Jürgen is a senior principal hardware engineer at Oracle. His specialties include chip architecture, power estimation, clocking strategy, TFT and us features, and many more which I will not list here. He has a B.E.N.G. with honors from the London South Bank University. Please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thomas Wicke. I'm together with my co-presenter, Jürgen Schulz. We're pleased uh, to present to you today Big Speed, the Scalability and Coherence Directory ASIC in Oracle Highly Scalable Enterprise System. Please note that this presentation outlines a general product direction, but is not a commitment for any specific product or feature. Here's the outline of the presentation. We have six sections. First, we will talk about the motivation and the design objectives of Bixby. Then we will talk about the current system, how Bixby is used in the current system and we'll show the full range of scalability we get with Bixby. We will talk about system RAS features enabled by Bixby. We'll then talk about the implementation details and some of the debug and DFT features. And finally, we will conclude with a summary. 
first motivation and design objectives. The M5 and M6 microprocessors, they have direct interconnects that scale up very well to eight processors using the coherency links. We can uh, refer to this at Oracle as glueless systems. However, this approach is not very feasible to scale much beyond eight processors. So we had to do two steps in order to increase our scalability. First, we had to introduce the scalability links, which we added to the M5 and the M6 processors. And we needed Bixby A6 in order to build larger systems. And these larger systems we refer to as glued systems. The design objectives for Bixby, there are three major areas that we needed to consider. The first area is large scale system scaling. We need to be able to scale up to 96 processors to match the capability of the M6 processor. And Bixby also is the communication switch between eight processor SMPs. The second area, coherence directory and processing, covers the requirement for Bixby to be the system-wide coherence point and process coherence requests from all processors. It's also, it also hosts the L3 directory and we need to be able to support multiple generations of processors, such as the M5 and the M6 processor. And even more so, we want to be able to operate in mixed processor systems, which means that the M5 and the M6 processors need to be able to work together in the same system so that customers can upgrade their system gradually. The third area, we clearly needed an enterprise system focus uh, since Bixby is deployed in large-scale systems. Specifically, this means an enterprise class RAS feature set and high bandwidth, low latency for excellent system performance. The latter makes a, a, the Bixby ASIC a non-typical ASIC. The intersection of these three uh, requirements or objective areas form the requirement set for Bixby. Just like in every other complex design, we had to face many uh, challenges and trade-offs. Here are the major ones that we had to face. First, first, the directory size, the large directory size requirement is not, cannot be met with just a single die size or with die sizing uh, with a single die and, and uh, uh, basically met with the die size. So we had to find out ways for Bixby to scale, the number of Bixby's to scale up with the system size. Directory width is another major issue because the number of L3 cache ways times the number of processors is a massive, massive number. So we had to find out why, and one way would be to pipeline lookups. However, this is a trade-off of system complexity as well as versus latency and throughput. Switch efficiency is another challenge that we had to face uh, because of uh, head of line blocking issues. We over provisioned the switch bandwidth in order to, order to solve that problem. And finally, Bixby is, being, uh, is, is um, processing transactions from multiple uh, domains at any given time. So we had to uh, be able, but some of the resources are shared. So we had to be able to associate errors to a single domain wherever possible and clean up shared resources so that other domains are not affected. Now we will talk about current systems and show the full range of capability, of ranges, ranging, uh, scaling capability of Bixby. Bixby is used in, uh, currently used in the Oracle's M532 system, which was announced uh, in March this year. There are 32 M5 process, Spark processors in this uh, system and 12 Bixby's. The Bixby boards are located here in these slots. There are four, as the system supports four physical domains and has a massive coherence link a payload bandwidth of 3.1 terabytes per second and an additional 1.5 terabytes per second on the scalability links. In this picture, we see the coherence interconnect of the M5 system. The uh, coherence links, the CLs, they are 12 lanes wide per direction. They interconnect the processes of an SMP. Uh, the the uh, domain, 
the hardware domain uh, granularity is actually the size of an SMP. So uh, they are shown here in the four gray boxes. The scalability links, there are four lanes wide per direction. All of these links operate at 12 gigabits per second in the M532 system. The resulting connectivity is 7 CL and 6 SL links per processor and 16 SL links per Bixby. But Bixby can scale through a wide range of systems. Here, with one set of six Bixby's, we can build 16 or 24 processor systems shown, 24 processor systems shown here on the right. With uh, two sets of Bixby, or two groups of Bixby's, or 12 Bixby's, we can build 30, 32 and 48 processor systems. And finally, with four uh, groups of Bixby's, or 24 chips, we can scale up all the way to 64 and 96 processor systems. So by increasing the number of groups in the system, we increase the scalability land bandwidth linearly as well. Or in other words, by increasing the number of processors by a factor 6x, we, can also, we also increase the scalability bandwidth by the same factor 6x. Here is now major RAS feature, a list of major RAS features that Bixby enables. Bixby supports up to 12 physical hardware domains. On the example on the left-hand side, you see two SMPs being part of one domain, A, and two additional domains, B and C, on the bottom, which are independent domains. The, do <coughs> the physical domains are dynamically configurable by the service processor. Either all SMPs are part of a single domain, or every SMP can be its own domain or any configuration in between. Bixby supports packet filtering and physical address fencing functions. For instance, a communication between the two top SMPs is allowed, but communication to any other domain is, not, is, is blocked by Bixby. Errors are resolved to physical domains wherever possible, and Bixby also supports a mechanism called cease operation which basically implies that if one component of a physical domain has a fatal error, we force down all components of that physical domain as quickly as possible. Bixby also supports a mode, uh, the five of six redundancy mode. As you might recall from before, Bixby's are organized in groups of six. It's possible uh, we can actually have failover configurations and any Bixby out of a group of six can be mapped out of the system, and the system can still boot. This is, increases availability of the system, since the system can still be used at the lower bandwidth level, though, before the system can be serviced. Bixby is engineered to support hot maintenance. It is possible to add or replace, test, and reintegrate either a failing Bixby or an SMP in a running system. For example, a Bixby is added in a system, built-in self-test is run on it before it's integrated back in, into the active system. Similarly, a new SMP can be added to the system. Again, BIST would be run on it first, together with an in, uh, interconnect BIST before it's integrated back into the active system. Finally, here are the main major features on the links, air, air protection features on the links. The, all links are CRC protected, and the, if the receiver detects a CRC error, uh, the data is automatically replayed. The CRC is strong enough to guarantee detection of a single lane failure, as well as a correlated four UI error across all lanes, lanes of an SL link. During link training, we pr uh, perform a stress test of the link uh, with pseudo random data. If a replay would not be successful, link retraining can happen automatically, initiated by hardware, without any service processor intervention. Also, if a lane is found to be bad during link training due to the te stress testing, it is again possible in hardware to map out any lane in any direction 
without any service processor intervention. And with that, I turn it over to Jürgen. Thank you, Thomas. Good evening, and uh, thanks for sticking around. Uh, let me start with the implementation details. To, uh, <clears throat> in order to provide the system connectivity, we have uh, 96 transmit and 96 uh, CERDES lanes that can run up to uh, 16 gigabits per second. Packages are 45 by 45 millimeter. Uh, BGA, and that allows us to minimize any signal integrity issues such as crosstalk in the pin field. It's uh, fabricated in a 20 nanometer ASIC process utilizing uh, 10 layers of metal, uh, with the top two layers being uh, thicker metal. Uh, to support the directory, we have 160 <clears throat> megabits of SRAM that allows us to track uh, 20 megabytes of tags. And uh, total gate count is 70 million gates, which includes the overhead for DFT and time enclosure. <clears throat> Here's a block diagram of Bixby. We have uh, a link framing unit, or actually multiple for link framing units. Uh, we have a input queue, which uh, accepts the packets. We have a forward crossbar for packets that would be flowing through the chip. For directory lookups, we have two crossbars, a uh, ASU crossbar in, which directs the packet to the corresponding directory, which is called the address serialization unit. And uh, there's an outgoing crossbar, and again, an outgoing queue and an outgoing link. Uh, so let's walk through a couple, a couple of uh, basic packets that we support. A forwarded packet, an example would be a data packet that would be traversing between CPUs. It would come in, it would get deserialized by the link framing unit, uh, CRC checked, uh, converted into a frame and then a packet, and then it would get queued into the input queues. Uh, based on the, the destination, it would be forwarded to the uh, forwarding crossbar, and the forwarding crossbar would uh, send it onto the corresponding output queue and the corresponding output framing unit, and then it would get serialized again on the link. For a directory lookup, it follows a similar path through the uh, link framing unit and the input queues, and it then gets sent to, <coughs> through the ASU crossbar to the corresponding address serialization unit that's processing that cache line. The uh, ASU would then do a directory lookup, and based on the uh, contents of the uh, directory, would uh, potentially generate multiple packets to multiple CPUs, for an example, a uh, set of invalidates. They would get sent out through the output crossbar, and again, output queues and the link framing units. Here's a picture of the floor plan. Um, we have uh, CRC and retry protection on the link units, uh, the CERDES and the link units and we provide a full uh, SecDead ECC data path throughout the chip, uh, and we have parity on the control signals. This allows us to provide end-to-end <coughs> -end protection of any packets that are flowing through the chip. The, uh, the floor plan comprises of the CERDES around the edge, and the directories are then tiled around the edge of the core, and we have the crossbars in the center of the chip. We've utilized uh, custom top-level routing, uh, which allows us to speed up the propagation delay uh, on critical nets at the top level, which uh, results in us being able to send uh, packets between the, uh, for instance, an ASU and the crossbar without adding any additional pipelining. Uh, this uh, reduces the overall latency through the chip. Uh, to provide a high-frequency design, we also implemented a custom clock distribution scheme that um, provides uh, low skew across the, uh, the chip, and that's especially important at the top level. Uh, let's go into a little bit more detail about each unit. Here's the link queuing, link queuing unit. It manages the by four scalability link. It comprises of a physical layer that uh, performs the framing and also the link training. Uh, at the link layer, we do the CRC checking 
uh, also contains a replay buffer if there are CSC errors detected, uh, followed by a protocol layer that would, uh, for instance, do the packet fencing for the domaining. The uh, protocol requires uh, multiple virtual channels for uh, deadlock-free operation, and they're also queued uh, in the queue. Uh, the LQ itself is part of a single physical domain, so any uh, events that would be detected would be resolved into a domain, and that domain would also map to a set of corresponding links. The link uh, FIFOs, which are facing <coughs> the scalability links, uh, see a longer latency for credit returns, so they're implemented with uh, deep RAMs, and uh, we have a SecDead ECC on, the, on those uh, FIFOs. For the crossbar units, we have implemented several parallel crossbars. This avoids uh, blocking uh, forwarded data traffic, or f avoids the forwarded data traffic from blocking the directory lookup traffic. And for each of the switches, we also analyze the efficiencies um, and took that into account when we did the data path sizing. For some of the switches, we also had to implement additional uh, virtual output queuing to in improve the efficiency. Uh, as you can see, the uh, efficiency of asymmetric switches um, is different from an asymmetric switch, and uh, this analysis was used to enable Bixby to fully sustain mixed requests and data traffic at the full CERDES line rate. The uh, forwarded switch is, e is handling a single domain at each of its links, therefore it can just stop packet processing. The uh, ASU switches handle uh, multi-domain traffic to and from the address realization unit, and uh, therefore any events that are detected there are cleaned up through a, a timeout mechanism to avoid blocking packets from unrelated domains. The switches flow through the packet so they don't inspect the packets and we have uh, parity on the routing layer of the protocol. The address realization unit is where the directory is contained. We've partitioned it into eight parallel units which are fine grain interleaved. This uh, reduces uh, hot spots in the uh, directory lookup, as well as providing uh, high throughput on, uh, for the directory lookups. The directory unit for every request that comes in has to process over 22,000 bits of information per cycle, and that adds up to a total of uh, over 180,000 bits that the chip is comparing every cycle. The throughput of the ASU is uh, 0.5 requests, or it can handle a, a lookup every other cycle, which gives us a, a total throughput of four lookups per chip. The uh, packets coming in are flow-through corrected before they're used. We also have SecDead on the directory itself, and any pipelining between the directory and the core logic is handled through a retry and a replay mechanism. The ASU sees all 12 domains, so if there is an event, it has to be resolved into the corresponding domain. And if it's a fatal event, then the resources that are used by that domain have to be automatically cleared. Uh, to also support the multi-domaining, uh, we do a partial initialization uh, based on domains. To avoid uh, single bits from accumulating into multi-bits, we have a background scrubber that's continuously running, and if it detects any high rates of uh, correctable errors, the um, service processor can get notified and it can potentially initiate uh, an L3 retirement to avoid using that index in the directory. Here are some of the uh, debug and DFT features. For these large systems, it's very difficult to debug and monitor the high-speed serial links. So we've implemented two internal rings that allow packet capturing uh, for any ingress or egress direction. Those packet streams are sent to a central monitoring unit uh, that um, has a built-in logic analyzer that can do packet filtering, uh, triggering, and time stamping. The packet flow is stored in a uh, internal RAM that can be accessed via the service processor for debug. 
For additional uh, depth of, of storage, the packet stream can be sent to an uh, external set of pins that would allow an external logic analyzer to also capture the packet trace. The in-system test features include memory bis to guarantee the integrity of the directory and interconnect bis to guarantee the uh, integrity of the links to and from the CPUs. For additional uh, diagnosis, the ASU uh, tagram or the directory tagram can be accessed uh, even when the system is running. So we believe we've met our design objectives, namely in large system scaling, uh, coherent processing, and um, enterprise class RAS features. In summary, uh, Bixby uh, implements the directory of the system and provides a high throughput for directory lookups. It uh, includes error correction, detection, and isolation features to enable enterprise class RAS and provides extensive debug and DFT features. And it also simultaneously pushes the ASIC boundaries, uh, technology boundaries in, in multiple directions. Uh, in summary, the glueless system can scale up to eight, and with Bixby, we provide flexible scaling up to uh, a factor of 12. Thank you. That's the end of the presentation. We can take some questions. Yes, please. Yeah, Satoshi Matsushita NEC. I'd like to ask you the, the directory, directory structure. Um, how, how big is the cache line size? It's uh, 64 bytes. 64 bytes. And then uh, uh, for the directory, the, is it a bitmap or linked list? It's a one-to-one uh, -one correspondence uh, of the L3. Direction. Okay, is it uh, the, 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 the store, the, the link, uh, bitmap? Um, I guess you would call it a bitmap. Okay. Uh, Doug Boyle from uh, Photonics. Um, question is, um, what's the latency for the forwarded request to go through the Bixby chip? Uh, we're not disclosing that level of detail. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Bill Rash, Intel. Um, I'm, I want to understand the uh, coherency protocol a little better. Uh, I'm curious about what fraction of uh, misses from a processor that uses a coherency link to one of the local seven other processors, what fraction of those transactions have to wait on a response from the Bixby in order to complete? Or can any of those transactions complete just between the two processors on the coherency links without waiting for a Bixby response? Typically, uh, transactions have to wait for the directory response. <coughs> Excuse me. They, However, have, they need to wait. They need yeah. to wait. Okay. As However, Ali mentioned in his previous presentation, the CPU does actually simultaneously send out a speculative read uh, mm -hmm. that actually runs in parallel with the directory lookup. So it, it effectively hides the directory lookup latency. Yeah. Okay, so yes. the parallel read can go and hide the weight for the big speed. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, we tried very hard to keep the directory look up below the memory access. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Jeff Stukely at IBM. I was curious, you show a, an image of the 32 socket system. It's a big, you know, 24 inch rack. What does the 96 socket system look like? <laughs> By three times the size? Is it, because <clears throat> I mean, you have like a full, there's no like localized connectivity, right? Sort of everything to everything, and so. Yes. How, so it just looks like three boxes next to each other. Essentially, yes. <laughs> and how it would there, look like that. Is it electrical cables or, or is it optical? They're electrical cables. Electrical. Okay. Interesting. Hi, I'm Manoj from Intel. Uh, congrats on the enormously complex system. Uh, are there any results from measurements or from simulations that show how much this complexity buys relative to some other workload from previous generations, maybe on a normalized scale, if not absolute? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any performance data to present at this point. Sorry. So is there any speculation on what this new architecture or this complex advancement will help achieve that we could not do before? 
Well, you know, with every improvement of technology, right, you, you can do more things. I'm not sure what a good answer for, for that question. It's a very open-ended question. So uh, certainly more things are possible and customers can upgrade their existing workload on shared memory system just on a new box and run it faster. So just like for every other technology step, we get, we get better improvement from generation to generation. Thank you. Let's uh, thank the speaker. This uh, concludes the session and the conference, but before you go away, we have closing remarks from Daniel, the program co chair. Oh, the general chair, it's even more. Yes. Yeah. Okay, you're almost there. Um, I won't keep you here long. I've got a few closing remarks, and after that, one of our sponsors is uh, going to give away a iPad. And as I'm saying that, I'm looking around if that sponsor is somewhere close by. Oh, he's sitting over there. Okay, so you can get on the stage once I'm done. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, a reminder, and that's you all got these evaluation forms. Uh, it is the last opportunity you have to fill them out, return them in the lobby. Please do so. We really used them last year. We were at a different location based on the information in those evaluation forms. That was one of the reasons why we went back to Stanford, for example. Uh, so this is the time that I start thanking people or groups of people. Um, so in a somewhat random order, first of all, thanks to our sponsors. At the start of the conference, I mentioned it, that their financial contributions allow us to keep the cost of this conference as low as possible. It's not that we make money. Typically, we use it to, uh, to reduce the fee for students. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the organizing committee and all the volunteers, especially the volunteers who were here Saturday morning and will still be here when you get home or back to your hotel uh, to tear down the conference. So I think they did a great job, so let's acknowledge that. Uh, I would like to thank the program committee. Uh, especially the chairs, Don Newell and Mike Flynn, for putting a, a very strong program together this year. I hope you, uh, you like the program. Uh, I would like to thank all the presenters, so regular speakers, keynotes, and especially the tutorial speakers. Last Sunday was really well attended, exceptional well, so very good. Um, and I would like to mention two people in particular here who helped out in the organizing committee. And I know I run the risk here of forgetting people, but I, I think they really deserve it. So, first of all, John Sell. Uh, I was browsing the internet this morning, and it seems that the rest of the world knows him as the guy who gave the Xbox presentation at Hot Chips. Uh, to us, he's the guy who takes care of the wine, the food, and the ice cream. So, thanks, John. And it was a pretty, pretty decent presentation as well uh, yesterday morning. Um, the other person, so, let, let, okay, I got a week ago, I got a box, and it was from Comcast. It was an upgrade. Uh, if I would just take out my old box and put in this new box, I would just get a, I think it would double or quadruple my internet uh, bandwidth access. It was, it was great. And there were four cables. I think it was power, telephone, ethernet, there was a third one. Anyway, it took me more than an hour to put that box in. So it's, it's obvious that I didn't put all this audio-visual equipment together. That's actually Lance Hammond. You don't see him, he's behind the screen, but he's responsible for all of that. That's a huge amount of work. Also, he is here from deep, well, early in the morning, late at night, to make sure that everything works. And on top of that, uh, he's the one who made sure that we could get back to Stanford this year because he did a whole lot of things related to the location management as well. So I'd like to thank him. Lance, thank you. <laughs> and then last but not least, of course, you. Uh, thanks for attending. I hope to see you next year. I hope you enjoyed the conference and uh, have a good drive home.